Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. God, I offer up to you my body as a living sacrifice. All my faculties, all my senses, I offer them up to you. God, I ask you to speak through my mouth today, look through my eyes. Speak through, speak through me. Touch through my hands, walk through my feet. Feel through my emotions, think through my mind. Here I am, God. Work through me. One of my goals is to help all of us come to the point where we're more God inside minded, where we really have a revelation that Christ lives inside of us, that we are the home of God. That is so amazing that every time we hear that, we should go, I am the home of God. Colossians 1.27 says, the mystery of the ages is Christ in us, the hope of glory. I believe that Christ has come to live in us because there's no way that we can hope to live the life that he wants us to live if his presence is not in us all the time, strengthening us, teaching us, giving us wisdom, giving us the strength to do what he's asking us to do. The good news is, is whatever God asks you to do, you can do it. He's never going to ask you to do anything that you can't do. He probably will ask you to do some things you don't want to do, but he won't ask you to do anything that you cannot do. So we need to believe, I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who strengthens me. Everybody say, I am the home of God. Now let's look at two scriptures, 1 John 3.24. And I suggest that you write these scriptures down, look them up at home on a daily basis, meditate on them until it really becomes a revelation to you that you are the home of God. All who keep His commandments, who obey His orders and follow His plans, live and continue to live to stay and abide in Him and He in them. They let Christ become a home to them and they are the home of Christ. They are a home for God and He is a home for them. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives where? 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 Whom you have received as a gift from God. You are not your own. You don't want to miss this part. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness, and paid for. <laughs> Made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. I encourage people quite often to take care of themselves. Take care of yourself physically. Take care of yourself mentally. Live a balanced life. I think it's important that as the home of God, that we look the very best that we can, have the best health that we can have, have a smile on our face, and not always be down and feeling bad all the time. Now, sometimes you can't help it if you feel bad, but there are things we can do and we need to do the things that we can do to honor God in our bodies. Why is it so important to me that I spend four whole teaching sessions here in Atlanta and put this on television all around the world. Why is it so important to me that I can get you to meditate on and understand that you're the home of God? Because I spent many years as a religious Christian. I did love God. I believe that I was saved. But I didn't know anything about what I had as a believer. I didn't know my inheritance as a believer. I thought God lived off up in the sky somewhere and someday in the sweet by and by, I would get to live with him. What a revelation it was to me to learn that he, he had come to live in me so we might be in close fellowship. That anytime I needed help, 
he was right there ready to help me I you know that to me that's a pretty big thing I mean if somebody's willing especially somebody like God <laughs> is willing for my whole entire life every second of every moment of my whole entire life is willing to be that close to me in order to help me I think that's something that we ought to get enthusiastic about and be excited about I think sometimes we get too familiar with what God has done for us and it no longer excites us anymore a few months ago I was saying to God you know I wish you would do some of the exciting things that you used to do when I first was filled with the Spirit and you know I just kind of miss those times I mean right away it came back in my spirit I do things all the time you've just gotten used to them so they don't amaze you anymore and how true that is matter of fact I've even thought about writing a book called amazing how we need to just learn to stay amazed I'm reading a book by a man who A.B. Simpson he's gone home to be with the Lord almost a hundred years ago and he said one of the first signs of a spirit-filled life is enthusiasm enthusiasm we should be so amazed about God and I think one of the things that is, is just more and more this is just coming into my heart and I've been meditating on it a lot and thinking about it and that's how things become bigger to you and more important to you is that we're the home of God that God lives in us well one of the things that I love about being at home is I'm comfortable there you know I'll, when I get home today I'll walk in and it's just like ah, can be comfortable there well since we're gonna be since we are the home of Jesus then I think we need to make sure that he's comfortable in us now you know where this is headed right <laughs> we need to do it because we love him honor him and adore him but secondly we need to do it because if God in us is not comfortable then the next thing that happens is we're not comfortable and I think a lot of people just don't feel right something's bothering them they can't put their finger on it they don't know exactly what it is they, they feel a heaviness they, they got a mood how many of you agree and I think it's because the Holy Spirit who lives in them is grieved about something that they're doing the way they're behaving an attitude they have the way they've spoken to someone without even realizing that they did it never bothering to repent and so the Holy Spirit is grieved and then that person feels grieved I think sometimes when we feel like that we should stop a moment and just say God is there anything that I've done that's grieving your Holy Spirit now maybe you haven't I'm not saying that you need to go on a witch hunt every time you get a little off mood but it doesn't hurt either to just say God if there is something that I've done you know if, if somebody in my house is grieved about something or somebody that I'm close to I get around them I feel it well if the Holy Spirit's grieved in me then I'm gonna feel grieved and do you know one of the things that the Bible says grieves the Holy Spirit very plain in Ephesians 4 starting in verse 29 is the way we talk to people the way we talk to people let's look at Ephesians 4 29 we don't want to pass up this opportunity I want God to be happy in me so I can feel happy I got I got a few people in here that are agreeing with me so that's good I've studied these scriptures in Ephesians a lot because I tell you I really do not want to grieve the Holy Spirit verse 29 let no foul or polluting language nor evil word nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace God's favor to those who hear it next verse 30 and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God <laughs> 
Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, and branded as God's own, secured for the day of redemption, the day of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath and passion and rage and bad temper and resentment and anger and animosity and quarreling and brawling and clamor and contention and slander and evil speaking and abusive or blasphemous language be banished from you. With all malice, spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind. And then it goes on to say, and instead of that, become useful and loving and compassionate and helpful. But I just want to make the point today that God is so close to us. And when we say mean things to other people, it hurts Him. When we mistreat people, it hurts Him. When we hang on to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, it not only hurts us, but it actually hurts God. Why does it hurt God? Because He paid a tremendous price for us to have a wonderful, wonderful, joy-filled, peaceful, prosperous, powerful life. It grieves God when we're miserable. If you have children, you know that you don't like to see them unhappy. You don't like to see them making bad choices or, or doing things that you know is hurting them. Some of you have children right now that are doing things that are destroying their lives. And it's just like one of the greatest pains that you have in your life. I heard recently that a mother can never be any happier than her child. We don't like it when our children are not happy. And God doesn't like it either. I'm hoping and praying that God's going to use me today to bring this God relationship on more of an intimate, personal level. He lives in us. And we can put a smile on God's face or perhaps even a tear in His eyes. I want God to be comfortable in me. Jesus is a resident in our home. And yet we respect some guests who drop by more than we respect the God who lives and dwells in us. One time I was having a temper tantrum with my kids. And you know, a lot of times if we're honest, when we're young mothers and we've got a lot of responsibility and we still haven't grown up in God and we're dealing with a bunch of nonsense and junk from the past, we're frustrated and we end up taking it out on our kids. I'm not talking about abusing them or beating them. I'm just talking about, you know, you're just frustrated and so every little thing that they do just puts you over the edge. And so I was upset most of the time. A lot of it was just because I felt guilty all the time. I was just like addicted to guilt. I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. And so I would tell my kids to go play. Then I'd tell them, pick these toys up, clean this mess up. I don't know what I thought playing was. I guess I thought it was standing in a corner going, <laughs> yes, mother, yes, mother, yes, mother, yes, mother. So one day something pushed me over the edge and I was, get this mess cleaned up. God, I can't believe it. All I do is clean around here and you mess it up. I'm so sick and tired of this. Can't you do anything right? And then after I had my little tantrum, I was, sorry, oh God, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, God, I just can't help it. Anybody know all about this? <laughs> and I was sorry, and I really thought I couldn't help it. You know, we can help a lot more than we think we can. But when we think we can't help it, and that it's just some bondage in our life that's beyond our ability to resist, then we don't do anything about it because we're deceived, deceived into thinking that we can't. And God just put this, this picture in my mind. And he said, you don't have to act like this. If your pastor came to the door while you were in the middle of one of those fits, you'd get over it. I mean, I would have answered that door, pastor, praise the Lord. Glory to God. I'm so, oh, well, the kids, oh, yeah, their little darlings are playing. <laughs> but the thing 
thing is, is that our great high priest, Jesus, Father God, the wonderful, precious Holy Spirit who teaches us and dwells in us, they're home all the time. And we don't seem to mind acting like that in front of them. God, I pray that you would put a double portion anointing on this message today. And that people would get it, that I would get it, that we'd all get it, that people watching by TV would get it. God sees everything that we do. He hears everything that we say. We don't leave him in the church on Sunday morning. We're his home. We are the home of God. It amazes me still every time that I say that. We need to learn that God is everything. Everything is about Him. Everything started in Him. Everything is maintained in Him. Everything ends in Him. And He needs to be the center of our life and number one in every single thing that we do. Let's look at Romans 12, 1. I'm going to show you a scripture that I think that you should pray over yourself on a regular basis. Paul said, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, and I beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Now, instead of getting up in the morning and giving God a list of 25 things that we have to have to even smile that day, <laughs> how about this? How about starting with Psalm 25:1? Lord, unto you too I bring my life. And then let's go on with Romans 12. God, I offer up to you my body as a living sacrifice. All my faculties, all my senses, I offer them up to you. God, I ask you to speak through my mouth today, look through my eyes. Speak through me, touch through my hands, walk through my feet. Feel through my emotions, think through my mind. Here I am, God. Work through me. Use me. I want to be your representative in the earth today. Father, when I go out the door, I'd like for people to feel after they've seen me that they've seen Jesus. Thank you, Father. You know, God is so impersonal and so unreal to so many people. And so many people in the world are in such a sad, pathetic condition. I am so grateful for what I know in the years that I have studied. Because knowledge of the truth keeps us out of deception. Many people have gone to church and been disappointed by a religious experience or by religious people judging and criticizing them. They've gone to church and found no practical help and so they think God can't help them and that makes me sadder than anything. And many people are looking for Jesus and the way they're gonna see him is through his children. We need more than a bumper sticker and some Christian jewelry and a little bit of Christian language and a CD player plugged into our head. We need fruit. Fruit. In the book of Matthew, Jesus cursed a fig tree. He walked by it. The Bible says that he was hungry. And he went to the fig tree looking for food. But there was nothing there but leaves. And if you study, you find out that a fig tree, when it bears leaves, is always supposed to have fruit under the leaves. 
Well, I look at all of our Christian paraphernalia like leaves. And so a lot of times people come to us looking for fruit because we've got the bumper sticker, we've got the cross around our neck. We're spouting off the praise of the Lord, thank you, Jesus. We get in our car and go to church every Sunday, but then they come, they're hungry and they're needy and they find no fruit. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it was a phony. I don't want to be a phony. I, don't, I refuse to be one way in the pulpit and another way at home behind closed doors. And I used to be one way in church on Sunday and a whole different way at home. Dave and I would fight all the way to church, but honey, when we got to the door, praise the Lord. <laughs> Disgusting. I can remember looking at the words on the overhead with my hands lifted up, mouthing the song, I Surrender All, being angry at Dave and thinking, thinking while I'm singing, if he thinks I'm cooking him anything to eat today, he's got another thing coming. <laughs> So if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this Christian thing, <laughs> then how about if we make a decision today to sign the title of the house over to Him and give Him access to every room in the house. Let Him out of your religious, spiritual room your church room and let him have control of the whole place. We sold a car a couple of weeks ago and they brought us the title. One of our kids went and got the title out of a safety deposit box and we had to sign that title over to the new owners. Well, see, some of you have got a new owner but you've never signed the title over yet. And it wouldn't bother me at all if you went home and actually took the trouble to sit down, act like a little child, draw up a little contract, a little title to your life, and just sign it and say, God, here I am. You take me and you do with me what you want to. Here I am. I'm yours. No more religious phony baloney. I want you to do what you want to with me. We need to make sure that we keep God first in our lives. The temple or the sanctuary among heathens is considered to be a shrine that contains idols. <laughs> among God's people, it was His house where His presence dwelt. Now we are the sanctuary of God. Can a Christian also worship idols? Yes. <laughs> you say, why? Why, I wouldn't do that. Do you know what? Absolutely anything can become an idol. I have to be honest and tell you that there was a time in my life when this ministry was an idol to me. When I actually ignored the wisdom of God in order to do things that I thought would make my ministry grow. And I'm grateful that I've learned and that I can say no now to what God says no to and yes to what God says yes to, irregardless of what people are going to think or say. But it was not always that way. Just like anybody who starts out, I had a lot of God in me, but I also had a lot of human ambition. I'd been abused in my childhood. I didn't feel good about myself. I got my worth and value out of accomplishment. And so I wanted to be the biggest, the best, the most, the greatest at everything. But my motive wasn't right. I didn't know my motive wasn't right, but my motive wasn't right. One of the reasons why the Holy Spirit lives in us is to constantly purify us and teach us. Thank God we keep learning and He teaches us. Your job can become an idol. Money can become an idol. Owning things be can become an idol. A person that you love can become an idol. You say, what do you mean by that? 
I mean that you are going to bow down to them and do what they want before you'll bow down to God and do what He wants. First Corinthians 6 19 says that we are the temple of God. That means that we are the home or the house of God. He lives within us and we need to make a decision to be mindful of Him all the time. We have been able to identify these villages through government and through some local pastors. So these wells, what we are drilling through Joyce Meyer Ministries, you know, we take proper care to find where is the good water through a good water diviner. It will take about uh, three days to go to that village and drill the bore well to give fresh water to the villagers. ారు <laughs> పాస్టర్ ద్వారా ఆ నిజమైన దేవుని తెలుసుకొని ఈ సంఘంలో ఆ యేసు ప్రభుని ఆరాధిస్తున్నాం